Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup with People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the top stories from across the globe. Let's take a look at today's headlines. Kiko Fujimori alleges systematic fraud in Peru's election as Pedro Castillo leads. Over 100 activists arrested during protest at pipeline construction site in the US. Residents of Luxury Islands protest Indian government's autocratic reforms. And in the video section, we take a look at the Block to Boat campaign to prevent Israeli ships from docking in North America. As the vote counting in Peru enters the final stages, left wing candidate Pedro Castillo has pulled ahead of far right presidential candidate Kiko Fujimori. Fujimori, in response, has launched allegations of fraud and irregularities in the election process but has yet to provide substantial evidence. During a press conference on June 7, she accused Pedro Castillo's left-wing Free Peru Party of stealing votes and committing fraud. As of 8.30 a.m. local time on Tuesday, with 96.9% of the votes counted, Castillo has won 50.2% of the votes. Fujimori from the Popular Force Party has won 49.7% of the votes. Castillo's party has denounced the allegations and urged election officials to protect the vote. According to the National Office of Election Processes, the runoff election on June 6 saw voter turnout of around 77%. Castillo won the first round of elections held on April 11th with 18.9% of the votes. He is a school teacher and a trade union leader. He led a nationwide teacher strike in 2017 against then President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. His platform includes a set of anti neoliberalism policies, including the nationalization of natural resources and industries such as mining, oil, and communications. He has also expressed support for rewriting the country's constitution. He has supported Latin American regional integration and, the supported, and he has supported calls for the creation of a plurinational state. Meanwhile, right-wing candidate Keiko Fujimori is the daughter of former dictator Alberto Fujimori. She is in favor of the existing neoliberal and exclusionary constitution. She is currently facing charges of money laundering and if convicted could face 30 years in prison. In our next story, we go to the state of Minnesota in the US, where over 100 activists were arrested on June 7th. Protesters led by indigenous women and two spirit people gathered at a construction site operated by the Enbridge Company. The protest was part of an ongoing struggle against Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline route. The cross border pipeline is around 1,000 miles long and stretches from Alberta in Canada to the US state of Wisconsin. As part of this project, Enbridge wants to construct a 340-mile pipeline through northern Minnesota. The company has claimed that it is only replacing the old pipeline. However, the new plan will double the flow of tar sands oil. The pipeline will curve through the indigenous Anishinaabe territory. Activists have stated that the project will violate indigenous lands and endanger the sacred wild rice plant. Moreover, once completed, the pipeline will carry 760,000 barrels of oil per day, increasing chances of a possible environmental disaster. Hundreds of protesters scaled a metal fence to reach the construction site near Park Rapids on Monday. They climbed on top of equipment while some chained themselves to bulldozers. Other activists blockaded the road leading to the construction site using a fishing boat, bamboo and steel cables. The indigenous led Guinef Collective has been one of the groups at the forefront of the struggle, police forces arrived at the site shortly after. By afternoon, a Department of Homeland Security helicopter could be seen flying over the protest, kicking up clouds of dust. Police in riot gear arrived at the site towards the evening and began arresting people. Python activists have previously accused Enbridge of paying for policing along Line 3. They have reported that police officers have followed activists, pulled over their vehicles, detained people in cages and used surveillance drones. In our next story, we go to India, where residents of the Lakshadweep Islands held a 12-hour hunger strike on June 7th. Communities on the islands have been protesting against a set of proposed laws which will impact their culture, livelihoods and their local ecology. The Lakshadweep Islands are a union territory, which means that they do not have their own legislative assembly. Rather, they are under the direct control of the central government through an administrator. The proposed laws that are at the center of the ongoing unrest include major changes to land ownership and regulation. The administrator, Praful Patel, who is a member of the Bharatiya Janata Party, will have absolute power to grant permission to develop land. The government will also have the power to evict and displace people. These regulations have been widely opposed by local residents, 94.8% of whom are part of scheduled tribes. 
Local dairy farms have also been shut down and the multi-billion dollar Amul company has been allowed to sell and franchise its products instead. The proposed laws also include the ban on the sale, transport, storage and purchase of beef and beef products. 96.5% of Lakshadweep's population is Muslim and around 65% of residents eat beef. The proposed ban will affect local cultural food practices as well as livelihoods. It is important to note that the beef ban has been a part of the right-wing BJP government's anti-Muslim sectarian rhetoric since a long time. Other proposed regulations include the disqualification of candidates with more than two children from council elections. The government is also planning to impose an anti-social activities regulation, otherwise known as the Gunda Act. It will give the administrator broad and discretionary powers to detain people. Police officers will also have the power to search and seize a house, vehicle, etc. if they have reason to believe that it has been or is about to be used for illegal activities. And for our final story, we take a look at the Block the Boat campaign by activists and workers in North America. Launched by the Arab Resource and Organizing Center, this campaign aims to block Israeli ships from docking in North American ports. Following the attacks on Gaza and the occupied Palestinian territories, activists have been picketing at ports in several cities. They were able to successfully turn away two ships owned by the Israeli Zim company in Oakland last week. Protests are also taking place in New York, Houston, Los Angeles and Vancouver, Canada. Here is a video feature on the campaign. Back up, back up. We want freedom, freedom. In response to a call by the Palestine General Federation of Trade Unions, PGFTU, for an international week of action between June 2nd and 9th, thousands organized protests in major ports of North America. In a move to hold Israel accountable for its crimes on Palestinians, activists and workers' movements have put up pickup lines on major ports in the United States and Canada to block entry for Israeli ships. The protesters stopped operations and blocked ships operated by Israeli cargo companies from docking. Protests have been held at the ports of Oakland, Los Angeles, Houston and New Jersey, among other places. A wide array of anti-imperialist and progressive groups and coalitions across the United States have joined together to organize these actions. We're, we're here today to sort of uh, send a message um, to the Zim company uh, that we are going to do what we can to make sure that you do not do business on our, on our shores um, and continue to profit off of the Israeli apartheid. We're participating in global movement for boycott, divestment, sanctions and embargo in Israel. Um, and if our government is going to continue to support Israel economically, support them um, through military aid, we were going to do, we're going to do what we can. The campaign targets incoming ships operated by the Israel-based Zim Integrated Shipping Services Limited, or Zim. Historically, Zim has been tied to the Settler Colonial Project of Israel, having been one of the shipping companies to transport early Zionist settlers. Zim is also currently one of the biggest transporters of weapons to and from Israel. Oakland witnessed the first of these pickets and prevented two Zim ships from docking. Zim had not attempted to use the Oakland port since 2014, when pro-Palestinian activists blocked its ships from docking for months. On June 2nd, the Oakland Dock Workers Chapters of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU, Local 10, joined organizers from more than 30 organizations from the Block the Boat Coalition to picket. On Friday, June 4th, an estimated 1,000 people showed up to the port to prevent the docking of the ships. A picket in New Jersey was met with heavy police presence and armored vehicles sent by the police departments of New York City and New Jersey. According to reports, there was an initial standoff between peaceful and unarmed protesters and the police, as the latter were refusing the picketers from entering the docks. But eventually the protesters prevailed. Similar demonstrations are happening elsewhere, with more pickets planned for ports like Detroit, Michigan and Vancouver in the coming days. Dock workers in Italy's Livorno and across South Africa also heeded the call for action and boycotted Israeli cargo ships during the bombing of Gaza. And this is all we have for this episode of the International Daily Roundup. For more such stories and videos, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, subscribe to our YouTube channel, 
and follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for watching.